SEC marketing rule update. Let's talk about it. Hey, what's up, financial advisors? Today, I have Richard Chen here to discuss the SEC marketing rule that was passed in 2021 and what you need to know as it comes to life in 2022, specifically regarding testimonials. But before we get into it, just first a quick disclaimer, Richard Chen is actually my lawyer. I just feel like I have to disclose that. Um, and by the way, I think he's a great one. That's my personal opinion. So like if my butt were on the line with the SEC ever, and let's hope it not, I want Richard Chen in my corner. So hey, Rich, welcome back to my show. Hey, thanks for having me, Sarah. <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> so Rich, before, before we start on the topic of testimonials, First, I just want to discuss your tagline being seasoned attorney serving investment advisors, public speaker who happens to be blind. So this is going on podcasts. It's also going on my YouTube channel. So the podcast people might not know that you are, and I hate the word blind because it has all kinds of connotations that don't necessarily apply here. But, I mean, how, you, you know, you have such an intense career. You're so successful and you've done it all with, and again, I hate the word disability, but you've done it all having this, this physical challenge that you've overcome so gracefully. How, I mean, how did you do it, Rich? How do you do it? I mean, look, I think the reality is that, you know, everyone in life has challenges. Um, this happens to be uh, a physical challenge for me. And, um, for better or worse, I've had it since I was a child. And so I think at an early age, it, it really taught me how to adapt, how to push forward, uh, and how to really think about ways in which to, um, to solve problems and, and to ignore a lot of the noise that's outside of the things that uh, I can control. At the same time, I feel extremely blessed because I have, uh, you know, been given a, a number of 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 of, of, of skills and and um, and uh, and and other traits that that have really helped me to, um, to 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 push through and to really hopefully be an encouragement to a lot of folks because I think that. In this day and age, when there's so much negativity out there, there really are a lot of positive things going on. And, um, you know, this is work that I'm very passionate about. So it's easy for me to push through a lot of the challenges that I face. And there are definitely day to day challenges, you know, with technology that I face and things that just, you know, you constantly have to deal with. But at the same time, you know, there there are ways of getting things done and there's there's hope and there's opportunity. So I just want to be an encouragement to people. You know that uh, whether it's a physical challenge or otherwise, you know you, you can you can do it. And um, and there's you know everyone has a is a good purpose in life. And my hope is that people find that purpose. Totally inspiring, Rich. Thank you. So Richard is a double H, as they say. He was at Harvard undergraduate. He wasn't there when I was there, but I wish he had been because it would have been like my only cool friend. I like hated Harvard and hated everybody from Harvard except with one or two exceptions. And you would have been one of the exceptions, Richard. He also was oh, Harvard Law School. He's worked at some of the biggest firms in the industry from Market Council. He was the editor in chief of Hedge Fund Law Report. Okay, so this is a super qualified guy. If you're not following him on LinkedIn, please take a minute. It's Richard Chen Esquire. Uh, he's connected to me. You can just DM me if you don't know him yet, because if you don't, then you should. So let's get on to the topic at hand. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Let's talk about the 2020 SEC marketing law. And it's going to be, I think, coming into fruition more in the year 2022, maybe, but I'm not a lawyer, so don't take, don't take my advice on that. What I think is people's biggest question about this is, okay, so there was something about testimonials. Can I do them now? When can I do them? How do I do them? That might be too much for this one podcast, Richard, but just give me, like, what are your thoughts on someone who asks that, that question? What, what about testimonials? Yeah, so so thanks, Sarah. I mean, the, the the good news is that the regulators finally saw the light that you know one of the best ways for folks to learn about an advisor is through comments that other people have to have to say about them, whether they're clients or you know third parties that that know the advisor. It's very important to have an understanding of what other people you know 
perceive of that advisor. At the same time, the regulators are still concerned about the fact that there may be cherry picking of statements that create a, a, a misleading impression of the advisor. And so they put into the marketing rule the permission for folks to use testimonials, which are the actual client statements about an advisor, or endorsements, which are third party statements about the advisor, not related to a client statement. So, but at the same time, they have certain disclosure requirements and certain other sort of substantive oversight requirements that you have to follow in order to make sure that folks understand um, potential conflicts of interest. For instance, if you know the person giving the testimonial or the endorsement is getting paid, or there's another relationship that could provide the incentive to uh, you know, provide a positive state about the advisor, the, the, the regulators want uh, the, the, the reader to understand that. Okay. So as with anything, disclosure of conflicts of interest. Yeah. No cherry picking. So what, what, how would somebody comply with the no cherry picking provision? Does that mean they have to ask all yeah. their friends? They have to have a record that they asked all of them? Could they just post up on LinkedIn and be like, hey, what do you think of me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so here's the interesting piece of it, right? Um, th there are several ways that you, you, can, you can do this. You can solicit uh, 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 comments from folks, you know, clients and other folks about you, and, and they can be posted on a page as long as there is no altering of those comments, right? So whether they're positive or negative, if the advisor just lets the comments uh, uh, be as they are posted, that would be fine. If, if an advisor wants to more proactively um, put out statements about, uh, you know, that, that, that include testimonials or endorsement, that's a little bit trickier. So um, if that happens, then the advisor has to make sure that there is a fair and balanced presentation. So what does that mean? Well, the SEC has clear what it doesn't mean uh, in that you don't have to provide an equal number of positive and negative statements about an advisor, because frankly, that may not be, you know, accurate because uh, you know, advisor maybe have has an overwhelming number of positive um, testimonials and comments, right? Um, but then uh, at the same time, the SEC says that you can't just simply say this, uh, you know, testimonial or endorsement is not indicative of everything that our clients have and others have to say about us. Um, they expect something that provides a glimpse of what is a representative view of the advisors. So for instance, if there are uh, negative you know, commentaries, you know, one of the things that they've suggested is that if you say basically uh, on the disclaimer where the testimonial or endorsement lies, you know, we have other statements about our firm, which you can find you know, on our website here. You, know, you can have something like that. And if that is a representative uh, you know, so sample of what the advisor you know, has, uh, uh, you know, with respect to, you know, statements that have been made about the advisor, that would be okay. I think there are other ways of taking care of it. But the reality is, if an advisor picks certain testimonials or endorsements to include, they're going to have to give some sense if there are, in fact, any negative statements about the advisor, you know, what those are, and some level, it's going to have to take place. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the bad that comes with the good. Okay. Yeah. And then how, you know, I mean, I remember about last year around this time, there was an announcement that there was this new law that was going to be coming into effect in 2021. And then what, what was it? May, I think in May or around there, it came yeah. into, okay. It came, became yeah. effective. So it became what, effective. Yeah. It became effective in, in, in May. All right. But, but the, uh, requirement to come into full compliance doesn't take place until November 2022, right? So what does that mean, though? It means that basically, uh, if you want to take advantage of the opportunities like posting testimonials and endorsements that the new rule affords, you have to come into compliance with the entire rule. And that is you know, for most advisors going to be quite a lot because it doesn't only cover testimonials and endorsements, but in, 
it, it encompasses uh, performance of presentation, uh, performance results, right? And so how you present those, that that's gonna be impacted as well as the fact that the definition of an advertisement has changed. So that will, it, you know, may very well change uh, the types of communications that advisor needs to look at in terms of, you know, whether they comply with the marketing rule. And then on top of that, it, an advisor that continues to use its existing advertisements that'll still be considered advertisements under the new rule has to make sure that that those advertisements will comply with the new requirements under the marketing rule as well. So it's a lot. Oh, that's all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and one of the other things that will be uh, necessary is that, you know, for certain advisors who use third-party solicitors in order to uh, market or provide client referrals, uh, an advisor may need to revisit its agreements with existing uh, solicitors and potentially enter into new agreements with third party solicitors, you know, where non cash compensation is paid because now they've expanded um, when you need an agreement. Uh, with a, a solicitor to cover not only cash compensation, but non-cash compensation that's example over $1,000. Example would be, sorry to interrupt, what would be an example? Yeah. Like if you find me new clients, I'll let you use my office space? Something like that. Yeah, uh, that, okay. that could be right. Or, you know, we'll provide you, uh, you know, with uh, uh, access to certain resources or things like that that are not specifically have a ca don't have a cash value, but they clearly provide a, a, a you know a, a pecuniary benefit. Uh, those you know will now be incorporated because the SEC still sees you know those benefits as creating a conflict. Okay, so let me just recap here. Yeah, because you know lawyers tend to be you talk very much at length and then me i'm popular for my two sentence rule which is like say yeah. it and then <laughs> so mm -hmm, we're very mm -hmm. actually good combination here richard <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay absolutely so you okay so no cherry picking um if you have to come into full compliance by november 2022 but if you choose right. to use any of these provisions allowed by the new law, then you have at the point at which you start using them, you have to fully comply. You can't right. just, you can't just like start doing testimonials and then be like, okay, well that advertising part about that law, I'm not going to be worried about that until November, 2022. Like you have to do it all That's at right. once. I guess, you, once you, you have to be. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and from what I've seen, I have very few uh, clients who have actually uh, gone through that process because it is a heavy lift. I, you know, I, I think it's a, I think there was a realization that this is a heavy lift. One other requirement I wanted to make note of actually um, two other ones with the testimonial rule is, is that a, a um, an advisor is going to have to have a reasonable belief that the, the, the testimonials or endorsements uh, that are provided, um, th there's a reasonable basis to believe that they're accurate and true. Um, and so whether that's you know talking directly with the folks who make the statements, or if it's a statement from a third party uh, who who you know got the comments from somebody else, that they have some way of you know verifying whether or not these are you know sort of. Um, accurate um, and, and there's a reasonable belief that the advisor you know knows that. The, the other thing is that in, in, in many circumstances, uh, those who are statutorily disqualified, meaning that you know they've had faced a certain uh, criminal or regulatory sanction, uh, won't be allowed to uh, provide uh, testimonials uh, and endorsements. So um, so you know so those are a couple of other sort of oversight things beyond sort of the disclosure and the uh, the need to have a client agreement um, okay, you know, for on. solicitation management. Yeah. So you mean like if I'm a financial advisor and one of my yeah. clients is a someone who's been convicted of a criminal offense, like they robbed a bank or something and went to jail and stuff, but they came out and now they have money from some other thing other than robbing a bank and I'm managing their money for them. They can't provide me a testimonial just because, well, I say just because, but because of the fact that they are a, a criminal in the past. It, 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 there are, it de depends on the circumstances, but in many cases that will be the case. Yes. Oh, okay. So clients 
or whoever is providing the testimonial, if they're statutorily disqualified, wow, I'd be like a lawyer. I feel so smart. (laughs) If they're statutorily disqualified, then they can provide the testimony. Okay. Right. All right. right. Yeah. It's good to know. Yeah. Um, You know, I mean, look, by and large, I think that the, the, opportunities are there with respect to testimonials and endorsement. And I think they are a valuable asset, right? Uh, in terms of understanding the perspectives uh, of, of folks other than the advisor, um, you know, in terms of getting a sense of what an advisor is to like to work with, um, you know, so, you know, sort of navigating some of these challenges, um, you know, once I think the initial push of getting through and getting used to, uh, the rules is there. I think that we'll have a, a pretty good working model of how to handle the compliance elements of it to make it work. Um, but this initial push is challenging because I think not only our advisors working through it, but frankly, I think the SEC is going to have to work through, you know, the the different ways that advisors try to come into compliance with the rule. Yeah. But that's not our problem, is it? <laughs> that's their problem that's my problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, yeah yeah that's for the lawyers it, and the sec to worry about not that's for sure that's right okay uh, yeah that's okay, what, that's rich. what that's what we're here for okay so rich thank you so much uh, you know always good to have you on the show um like i said you know rich is my lawyer and and as you can see uh, it's I'm, I'm pretty glad so Everybody, if you want to contact Rich, it's what, what, LinkedIn, Rich? LinkedIn is great. You can also email me. It's rich at richardlchen, C-H-E-N.com. So yeah, rich at richardlchen.com. I'm always happy to uh, be a resource. You know, the, uh, why I'm in this space is I'm passionate about serving advisors and wanting to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that I can get them to uh, where they want to be. Yeah. And the other thing is Rich is great to follow on LinkedIn um, because he really posts like informative things that like, to be honest with you, some of the stuff is over my head. So I'm always like, my comments are, I always read it. Right. And they're always like, Rich, wait a minute. What do you mean? <laughs> There's it, always a question. Right. But I think that's oh, sure. great because it really helps the people in my network. Um, so financial advisors, just even just follow him on LinkedIn because you won't be sorry you did that. He's always informing and explaining things. And I really do feel that he has your best interest at heart, not just looking to like rack up, you know, whatever credibility or hours or whatever. Like, I really do feel this is a person who sincerely wants to improve the integrity of the profession. And I think that he does that on a daily basis and what he does. So Rich, thanks oh, for being here. Yes. No, thank you for the kind words, Sarah. You're totally right. I mean, and maybe it's my journalistic instinct, but I love to have an impact on folks, right? And you yes. can do that whether they're my client or, or not, right? And I feel like, um, uh, you know, this is, it's an admirable profession and folks are trying to do things the right way. But frankly, a lot of these regulations are hard to understand. So that's where I can be helpful. Yes. And also I wanted you, everyone listening to this, to reference the past podcast that we did on this topic yes. that is on my website and I will also link it into the blog. So that is all that we have for you for now. And I'm going to have to say goodbye, but we will see you next time. Please subscribe to this show.